Welcome to Shine Chats. Uh, I'm Stan Bergman, the CEO of Henry Shine, and today I have the distinct privilege, and in fact an honor, to be joined by Dr. Gerald Harmon, the 176th president of the American Medical Association. Dr. Harmon is a retired Major General in the United States Air Force and has been a dedicated family medicine specialist for more than 30 years in coastal South Carolina. His distinguished record of service includes board chair and president of the South Carolina Medical Association. Dr. Harmon is also a professor at two of South Carolina's medical schools and is a member of the clinical faculty of Tidelands Health Family Medicine Residency Program. Dr. Harmon is in a unique position to provide us with thinking as we hopefully see the end of the pandemic, uh, taper down the pandemic, and ensure that public health and the health of Americans is advocated for and front center stage of this great country as we emerge from the pandemic. Dr. Harmon, thank you for joining us. Thank so, you, Stan, honored to be here. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Harmon, we are living in uh, unprecedented times, of course, that's probably the understatement, with profound challenges. One issue of mutual interest is addressing health inequities in the United States, a problem that has been highlighted, magnified during this pandemic. What is your view on this issue and how best to address the area of access to, to care and, of course, the challenge that we're experiencing of health inequities in this great country? Please, sir. Stan, our mission statement is to advance the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. The second half of that mission statement defines our goal. The, the AMA is committed to ensuring that all people and communities have the opportunities, conditions, resources, and power to reach their full health, optimal health potential. Unfortunately, we've seen in the pandemic how longstanding inequities and social injustices and uh, disparities have contributed to disproportionately uh, to severe outcomes from communities of color in, in our country. Uh, the disparities, in fact, are striking. Uh, uh, we just had a study published in the Journal of AMA that shows that we've lost a year of life expectancy in 2020 for all Americans, a year of life expectancy for all Americans. But for Black Americans, we've lost two years of life expectancy. And for Latinx Hispanic residents, we've lost three years. So there's an incredible disparity and, and health equity uh, that's peeled back as we look at the pandemic and, and, and what's going on. So, and we have a bunch of fundamental reasons. We have historically marginalized, marginalized communities that uh, have always suffered from uh, a higher risk and in, in, in outcomes from diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, even cancer. And so it's a big deal to us at the AMA. We formed, we actually formed uh, a center for health equity a couple of years back, and we've released a, uh, a strategic plan to address health disparities and advance health equity within the U.S. And I'm the spokesperson. I was the board chair, but we have established a, a health care health equity task force. We came back and formed a center for health equity. We employed a full time now senior vice president uh, is health equity. And we're, we're moving forward to address the disparities that you've you've uh, supported and mentioned in, in your question to me. Thank you. One critical way to mitigate the pandemic is vaccination, perhaps the critical area. And physicians could certainly help accelerate vaccinations if there was an opportunity to administer these vaccines, the COVID vaccines in their practices. In theory, the uh, vaccines are available to physicians in their practices, but it's quite complicated for physicians to actually access the COVID vaccines and the regulations for physicians to access those vaccines varies uh, by state and actually within states by in some instances, for example, in New York City, the way to access vaccinations 
COVID vaccinations is different to other parts of New York State. Uh, Dr. Harmon, can you describe why and how physicians should have more access to the vaccine? And what impact that could have on stopping the spread of the pandemic? So the issue is, how can vaccines stop the spread of the, vac uh, the pandemic? And how, in fact, can physicians access the vaccines? And what can we do to ensure that it's easier for uh, uh, MDs, specifically those in private practices, to access the vaccine? Well, Stan, you've, you've, in, in your question, you've, you've given me a lot of clues to the answer. You're right. It, historically, um, we, we've had nothing to match this pandemic. And so we didn't have the urgency to develop the vaccines and use that as an offensive weapon against this devastating virus. Now that we have them, they're, the vaccines are absolutely effective. They're incredibly safe. They've been rapidly developed with good technology, shelf technology was already there, but we've never had a pandemic that have allowed us to move through the bureaucratic and regulatory barriers that existed in previous vaccines over the years. You'd have to develop various stages and wait for the funding from the, the grant writers, the federal government, the NIH and things like that. When we've developed these vaccines, we meaning medicine and healthcare in general with a, a good uh, collaboration between private and, and uh, public infrastructure, what we've done is we've eliminated the regulatory burdens, just funded it all up front, basically throw money at a problem and gotten a great result. So what we now have to do, and you, you've also nailed it too, is we need to build upon the confidence that patients typically have in their frontline doctors, the confidence they know to take my advice and, and say, you know, I'm not sure that I trust uh, a research that in, in what's called uh, emergency use authorization vaccine that has been developed so rapidly. And there's a lot of misinformation available on uh, public websites, on social websites that are not really soundly peer reviewed and sponsored by folks like the AMA and scientists and the CDC. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. What people do, and we have studies that show this, they trust their local doctors, their family doctors, their frontline physicians to give them sound advice, to provide them good health care. And in the case of the vaccine, to give them the right uh, defense against this, this virus. And, but because of the virus, we've had incredible logistical situations. You know, the two most, the two frontline vaccines we came up with first were, were, first were both messenger RNA vaccines with Pfizer and Moderna, and they had to be kept in like, sub-zero temperatures, 90 degrees Fahrenheit below uh, temperature in your standard uh, thermos that's cooler that you buy at the uh, near Covina store just didn't gonna hold it very long. You can't even stick it in dry ice or anything. And, it, and so when you transport it, you had to have ultra cold storage facilities, not something I have in my ambulatory practice and most physicians couldn't work. So we had to depend on large scale, large scale distribution centers and that was less than effective. Now we need to be able to get those vaccines into the arms of our patients at our primary care offices. And we're working hard locally in my system to do that. We have to have distribution points to your point uh, of these vaccines and the vials and get the actual materials into our doctor's offices so we can give it to our patients. Uh, uh, one of the key areas to mitigating this vaccine hesitancy, one of the key ways to deal with that is through the local physician who is trusted. And we need to put the physician in that position so that they can speak to their patients and simply administer the vaccine as they do with so many other vaccines. Uh, and as you mentioned correctly, uh, the way the logistics have significantly improved and it's now time to offer more physicians or practically any physician that would like access to these vaccines in their practices. And it's truly a remarkable achievement, a remarkable public-private -pri partnership that we in this country uh, obtained this vaccine, got this vaccine through the regulatory process in record speed, and these vaccines are effective. So, Dr. Harmon, sir, in your acceptance speech as president of the American Medical Association, you mentioned how the pandemic revealed weakness in our public health infrastructure. How can public-private partnerships help improve our healthcare infrastructure? Public-private partnerships were extremely effective in bringing the vaccine to market, uh, rapid point-to-care tests. What can we do now long-term to improve the healthcare infrastructure through public-private partnerships? And what value do you see in continued collaboration 
from the distribution and supply chain arm of healthcare. How can we, in the private sector, work with physicians to improve on the infrastructure? Stanley, great question, and, and you're right. We, uh, the, the great thing about public health, and we, we, we use that as a very broad term, we, the great thing about a public health infrastructure, when, it, when things are going well in the public health infrastructure, the, the government, the bureaucracy, the, uh, the regulatory bodies, they're, they're looked at it as a pejorative term, but they, as long as you get good water systems, as long as you get good sanitation, as long as your electricity is turning on and your sanitation systems, your waste treatment, everything's going well, in a good system, you don't even know they're there. So they're out of sight, out of mind. And the, you only really notice them when you have a pandemic or something goes wrong. And we need to be prepared. We need to accept as a society that that public health infrastructure is critical, even when things appear to be rolling along smoothly. They roll along smoothly because there's a public health infrastructure, because there's a, a private public relationship so that we have good transparency, communication, lines of distribution, such as the pandemic, not only the, uh, the vaccines to treat these viruses, but you mentioned the testing uh, facilities. We Early on, we struggled to find uh, the ability to test with accuracy whether a patient actually had the virus and was contagious or affected. And we didn't know enough about it, and we didn't really have good uh, access to that. And so we had to struggle to set that up. Then we later on had to have some access to some treatments because we developed treatments before we had a vaccine and their treatments, things like monoclonal antibodies. And who'd have known as a family medicine specialist, I would have monoclonal antibodies roll off my tongue and, thing, and say things like bamlanivimab without stumbling over it. I, goodness, it's almost a, a, a second language now to all of us when we talk in terms of COVID pandemic. But all of this is based upon, as you said, a public-private partnership that has to be transparent, that has to be funded. You know, public health infrastructure, I think, has fallen by about 16 to 20 percent funding over the last couple of years. We know now that we have uh, the potential for any manner of public health emergency that could be underlying any, any year that we come up with. So we need to budget and plan ahead and make sure we have a better partnership between the public and the uh, private uh, uh, industry going forward to, to help prevent what we ha have unfortunately learned through hard lessons over the last pandemic year. We just have to work closer and uh, organizations like the AMA and our industry, the supply chain industry can really make a difference in uh, advancing the capacity of our infrastructure. And Stan, uh, let me, let me I, I don't mean to interrupt sure. the boss of the show here and the host, but let me tell you, your, your organization, Shine, is, is a clear example of, and this is, you and I didn't talk about this ahead of time, but I will tell you, you're a clear example of the good that can come in a positive uh, infrastructure between public and, and private organizations that really serve the health of America. Uh, in our practice, we regularly use Shine products. I'll tell you, it's, it's been more than effective and efficient. We've relied upon them for decades, and you've always been there. So that's that's not only just uh, in, in the pandemic, but in day to day. So this is the kind of conversation we need to make sure happens at every level and in, in many organizations and relationships between the office-based practitioner, the ambulatory care physician, and the, the suppliers of these critical needs resources for our patients. I, I appreciate that comment, uh, Dr. Harmon. Um, where we collaborate with practices, we can be extremely efficient and advance the good of society in general. So uh, public-private partnerships were recognized by Benjamin Franklin over 200 years ago when he spoke about enlightened self-interest, doing well by doing good. And I think part of the success of the United States of America is the fact that industry works so closely with other sectors, whether it's the healthcare profession, government, local, uh, the world, health organization, the World Food Program, all of these organizations working together with the private sector and the profession can make a huge difference. It, was, it would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge your distinguished role as a major general in the United States Air Force. Could you leave us with the, some, perhaps a little bit of anecdotal experience, some thoughts, that have either paved the way for your journey in medicine or how it helped shape you as a leader during a time of profound change and uncertainty. It must be a deep clock in you which drives you to public service, 
starting out in the US Air Force, in your private practice, in your leadership at these dental, at these medical schools, and now, of course, as head of the president of the AMA. What's that clock? What experience got you here? Stan, you know, it's a very deep question. And, and I will tell you, I think that many of us have that clock within us. We, especially in healthcare and in the military, it's a, it's a desire to serve. It's a desire to, in my inauguration acceptance speech, I talked about acting worthy of oneself. I, quoting a Revolutionary War Major General Physician too, who uh, died at Bunker Hill. He gave a speech before then and said, we need to act worthy of ourselves. I think that's what's in, embedded in my core. I think it's embedded in your core and many uh, around the world, but particularly in America, which we're blessed to, to live in. Uh, it, it, we act worthy of ourselves. We, we serve a higher calling. To be a doctor is ability to touch more than one person with a, a stethoscope at a time. If you can work in organized medicine, take leadership roles when they're offered to you. Uh, serve well and, and act worthy of yourself. It's an amazingly emotionally and psychologically re, uh, rewarding profession and career. The military, same thing. Healthcare and the military, that combines two, the best of many worlds that I work within. So I'm honored to have been able to serve in leadership in both of them. I'll tell you some things that I've learned in my uh, experience in the military. I talked about early on in the interview about trust and confidence and, and faith in one's physician. You know, in private practice or in uh, an ambulatory setting, especially in family medicine, not every physician gets to work in family medicine and the front line. Some are doing their honorable role, serving humanity and acting worthy of themselves in laboratories and research and, uh, and maybe an x-ray department and, and a place where they never really see as many patients one-on-one, -on -one, but they're doing a remarkably dependable job and people tend to not even see them. It's like the public health infrastructure, but not beyond the lines. You may not know how good your radiologist is in your local community until you need that very important CAT scan or ma magnetic resonance imaging, the MRI, to help define the presence or absence of disease or illness. So it's a big deal. But one-on-one, -on -one, it's easy to get that confidence when you establish years of relationship. So you, you learn that trust uh, with uh, your patients and, and, and they learn to take your advice and trust you. And the military is a different type of trust. It's not so much an in, a trust in the individual if you're a patient going to a military physician, because you tend to have a different institutional trust. And that's kind of a blend of trusting the provider in front of you versus the institution that provided the provider. When I was in the military, one striking moment I remember is I was coming back on what we call an air evacuation flight, a medevac flight from the theater forward in uh, Baghdad, Baghdad International Airport with wounded soldiers, uh, airmen, sagers, soldiers, airmen, uh, sailors and Marines. And, uh, there were some critically wounded folks that were badly wounded that had been stabilized in the field hospital there in Baghdad and then were moving back from uh, the theater uh, hospital to the United States to a more advanced medical care. And some of them had some families with them. Some were walking wounded, some were more critically ill in floating ICU or mobile ICU units. And I remember all of these folks, they didn't know me. They didn't know that I was a physician. They didn't know anybody by name or, or anything that was providing care for their loved ones or themselves. But they had an, an incredible amount of trust in the institutional health care they were receiving from the United States government, Department of Defense, and the military. And the way we've earned that over the years is we've uh, continued to overcome any kind of resistance or lack of trust by continuously demonstrating overwhelming competence. And, and I, I, that's held true to me now. Is one of my guiding mantras for, for decades now. Anytime I'm in a situation where people have to understand, if, am I really genuine? Am I really giving you good advice? If I'm continually giving you overwhelming confidence and you'll begin to uh, trust me and trust my advice, my relationship. And that's something that's unique many times to the military. And I've translated that to my civilian world as well. Well, Dr. Harmon, you have certainly played a role in advancing trust within the US military and within the community you're in, and of course now at the American Medical Association. We need this kind of leadership, and you're exhibiting it. So I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. <laughs> what can I say? Thank you for your service to this great country, to the medical profession. Those are a few words for a huge amount of sacrifice and commitment you've made to this country and to 
our citizens, and in fact, the broader population in the world, given that you served with the US uh, Air Force. So I want to thank you for those countless people that have benefited from your service that you will never, ever meet. So thank you, thank you very much, sir. And uh, good luck in your new role at the AMA, and might add, post AMA, because I don't think this is the end of your service. So thank you very much, sir. Stan, you're a gracious gentleman, as your organization is. And I, I thank you on behalf of all the people that I represent. It's not me as a person, but it's a representation of the ability to serve among, as you describe it, countless folks who made the sacrifice. I continue to do that every day. First line, healthcare, military, and every opportunity, not just front line, but the researchers, the scientists, the teachers. Thank you. It is an honor. Thank you very much. And all the best for the future. And look forward to observing how uh, your presidency uh, goes and hopefully uh, as we wind down this pandemic uh, to observe how our physicians have played such a key role. So thank you very much.